Welcome to Sound Bites, hosted by registered dietitian nutritionist Melissa Joy Dobbins. Everyone, I hope you're having a wonderful December and making the most of the last month of this decade. You know, this is the time of year. It's not just the holidays, but the time of year for my annual podcast survey. So I would really love to hear your thoughts and feedback on the podcast. And if you complete the survey before the end of the year, you'll be entered into a drawing for a $100 Amazon gift card. I really do value your insights and opinions, and I use these to help my planning for the show in the new year. So please take a few moments to complete the survey at soundbitesrd.com slash podcast. And you know, you can always email me anytime with questions, comments, input at melissa at soundbitesrd.com. I hope you enjoy today's episode, and please stay tuned after the show to hear some important announcements from my partner, the American Association of Diabetes Educators. Enjoy the show. Hello, and welcome back to the Sound Bites podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Joy Dobbins, a registered dietitian nutritionist. And on the show, we delve into the science, the psychology, and the strategies behind good food and nutrition. And today's episode is all about individualized, personalized, customized approaches to weight management and some of the uh, psychology and strategies involved with that. My guest today is Dr. Gary Foster. He is the chief scientific officer at WW, formerly Weight Watchers. Dr. Foster is a psychologist, an obesity investigator, and a behavior change expert who has authored more than 175 publications and three books. And Dr. Foster just received an award from the Obesity Society for Distinguished Public Service, and he can tell us more about that. Welcome to the show, Dr. Foster. Glad to be here, Melissa. Well, I should say welcome back because you were on episode 121 not too long ago, and that is actually one of the top five most popular Soundbites podcast episodes to date. And that was titled From Stigma to Self-Compassion, Mindset Matters. And I loved our conversation. And I'm so excited to have you back on the program. And I should mention in full disclosure that this episode is a partnership with WW. And we thank them for their sponsorship and support of the Soundbites podcast. Now, we talked a lot about your background and your role at WW in the previous episode. But could you tell us a little bit about that uh, before we dive into this customized approach and the big news that you have to share? Sure, happy to. So my role at WW as the chief science officer is to really do three major things. One is to oversee our clinical research portfolio. So that's research that comes before a program is implemented out in the community. So we wanna make sure before our programs go live, so to speak, that they have good science behind them, not just science-based, that's important to us, but we actually wanna test them before uh, we make them available to our members. And then once the program is out there in the real world, then we do lots of different studies. We might compare our programs to self-help, do it on your own. We might compare it to going to a doctor's office. We might compare it to a, a variety of different things. We also do a lot of research on things like weight stigma, self-compassion, characteristics of successful weight loss maintainers. So that's the clinical research side. The other side is to embed, when people think about a science officer, they think about food and nutrition and activity. But a lot of what we do and underpins everything we do is behavioral science. And that's a different sort of science, but a science nonetheless. So whether it's working with our product team on the digital products, whether it's working with our workshop team where we have face-to-face -face workshops or with our content team, that delivers fantastic content. We're always trying to embed the best of behavioral science and everything we do, because at the end of the day, we're a behavior change company and we can quote, give people or tell people about all the latest science 
in nutrition and activity. But if there's not behavioral science to help with the how, then telling people the what doesn't bring much value. And then the third thing that our team has responsibility for is the program. So we continually evolve our program based on what people are telling us they want, what are cultural trends, but also importantly, finding the intersection between what people want and what science can reliably deliver. So that's always a little bit of a tension for us because sometimes people want things that just aren't possible or there's no science to support that. And we'll try for a bit. If we can't get it, then we have to go with science-based techniques. Always looking for that intersection between what people are looking for and what science can do. And then as a global company, our team is responsible for disseminating that across the globe to our training folks, to the folks who are you know, meeting with our members every day and you know, 30,000 face-to-face workshops per week across the globe. Excellent. Yes. And you have, and I want to underscore this before we talk about the big news, but you really have quite an extensive and impressive background in weight management and eating disorders. Tell us a little bit about the work that you've done in that area prior to coming to WW. Yeah, I've been fortunate to really work with great people and to have interacted with lots of people who struggle with their weight in one way or another. Most of my career has been helping people who are at the high end of body weight and the consequences that that brings, whether it's diabetes or sleep apnea uh, or psychological distress. So in the beginning of my career, I was very interested in clinic-based treatment, so different types of diets. Did some of the first work on a low-carb diet, looked at very low-energy diets, looked at combining behavioral techniques with pharmacologic techniques, looked at surgical techniques, but was really sort of thinking in an academic medical model and a hospital-based system, what was the best treatment that we could deliver to folks and you know, made some progress there, I think. And then in the last 10 years before I came to WW, I became equally interested, if not a bit more interested, in how to scale things outside the community. And some of those were treatments, so help develop a treatment for childhood obesity that could be scaled at YMCA's at the time. We looked at ways that you could manipulate where things were on the shelf in the supermarket. So without changing prices and without telling anybody this is, quote, the healthy choice, could we get people to consume more water, uh, lower calorie, healthier options? And then also finally spent a lot of time in low-income neighborhoods in both schools as well as corner stores, sometimes called bodegas, where there's a preponderance of unhealthy foods being served in these corner stores and bodegas that are around the school environment, and they're strategically placed there. And kids are eating almost 400 calories a day in these corner stores, so did some intervention work there. And that eventually led me to WW. Um, I should have mentioned that for about three years of my career, early in my career, I spent time as a therapist on an eating disorders unit. Mm -hmm. So really got to see, feel, understand the pain of that condition uh, and the families that it impacts, whether it was anorexia, bulimia, or a variety of other conditions. So I've been fortunate and you know, my patients have taught me a lot. Certainly doing a lot of research has taught me a lot. So I feel really privileged and feel a great sense of responsibility coming into the, the WW role some you know six years ago to leverage all the science, leverage my experience, and instead of helping you know hundreds of people per year, really take pride in, in our ability to impact you know at this moment uh, between four and five million people across the globe. Excellent. You mentioned the behavioral health, and in our last discussion and our last episode, you know we really talked a lot about what's in your head is just as important as what's on your plate, and I think that sort of mantra kind of attracted a lot of people to to want to hear more like, okay, you've got my attention. And so we talked a lot about that. But we're going to take it a step further in today's conversation. Talk to me about how when people get fixated on food choices, and things kind of get a little bit maybe overly structured or rigid, versus the flexibility and the customization and how that concept really led to the new program that we're going to talk about today. Yeah, I think the genesis of the new program, My WW, is really about what works well for one doesn't necessarily work well for another. 
And it goes to your point, Melissa, about mindset and what is in your mind does matter. So what we found uh, continuously as we piloted this program is people could be on two wildly different plans in terms of the foods, in terms of points, and in terms of a lot of different mechanics of the plan, but they say exactly the same words about it. It's very flexible, or they say it's very structured in good ways. So people come at this in very different ways. They come at it with um, and this is what our assessment is really trying to tease out, is what are the foods you're eating now? What are the foods you'd like to eat? And what's your general overall approach? Are you the type of person who likes a um, little more guidance? Like here are a list of foods that you don't have to weigh, measure, or track. And if you have a lot of those foods, then you'll have less points. Other people like more points and a way to think about, I don't, I'm not really so concerned about this list, and that doesn't you know, sort of do much for me. I want to be able to, within moderation, eat anything I want and just still track it. So the fundamental, and this is the way we go about innovation at WW, what are consumers, what are members thinking about in ways that make sense to them? And the thing that we really heard from people around the globe loud and clear is, look, I'm living in a context of everything's personalized. Just go down the toothpaste aisle, the yogurt aisle, like there's 85 variations and sometimes that can lead to sort of choice paralysis because I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. What we trying to do is really say, let's get a science-based assessment and then find a plan that works for you. So we're really excited about that insight and then our ability over the last two years to iterate on it, do good science and come out to the program has shown to be effective. Great. Okay. So the new program is called My WW. It launched on November 11th. And it seems like it's all about freedom and flexibility and, again, this customization. And I should mention you have quite an impressive scientific advisory board. So let's talk more about what exactly the new MyWW program is and what makes it different and what makes it successful. And I know you have some research to share with us. So I'd love for you to get into that as well. Sure. Happy to. Again, the basic premise is that everyone's different and what works well for one doesn't work for another. And I think that's so intuitive on the one hand. On the other hand, if you look at most weight management programs, including ours, for decades, what we have been doing is saying we have one program and everybody has to fit to that program. And we still felt relatively good about it because we did good science and on average, people did well. But obviously, averages, <clears throat> there are people who do less than average. There are people who do more than average. So what this approach says now is instead of saying to four and a half million people across the globe, everybody's going to, you know, do well on this program. And on average, they do. We're now able to optimize which program you will do best on. And the kind of research we did was to do an assessment and then to pick a plan or to assign a plan, match people to a plan that's best for them. And how we decide that is when we give people the assessment and they're matched to a plan, we ask them, is this a plan that you believe fits to you in your lifestyle? Is this a plan that you're confident you can follow? And is this a plan that you think will be easier to follow? And we have a pretty high standard in the high 80% for people who agree or strongly agree to that. Then we ask them those same questions after they've been on the plan, because it's one thing for the assessment to really do a great job of inspiring confidence and making you feel like this program works for you. But really the test is once you've been on the plan and we have great results both right after the assessment and then after people have lived on the plan that it really does feel customized. And why that's important is that you could have the most effective weight management program in the world, but if people don't engage with it, it's not going to work. And I think this is where you hear sometimes that it really matters. Do you engage in a program? You know, if you're not able to follow the plan, it doesn't make any difference how great or not great the plan is at that point. So we've leveraged the scientific principles of our program around zero point foods and around smart points from a nutritional perspective. And then we've just been able to take those up and down in ways that fit members where they are. So what we're really excited about is for the first time in our history, we'll have multiple ways to do the WW program. For the first time in our history, we'll have a personalized assessment. And importantly for our current members, uh, when they transitioned back in November, 
they weren't forced to a new plan. So if they wanted to stay on the plan they were on, they could. If they wanted to look at different plans, they could do that as well. So it's a way to bring flexibility, which we've been doing for the last three or four years as we've evolved the plan. But now it's not just flexibility, but it's personalized flexibility. Because again, what's flexible to one is not flexible to another. Right. I was just thinking that your program already had flexibility. And as I'm listening to you, like, well, there's even more flexibility, but the differentiation is, yes, this personalized approach. So could you speak more about the behavioral assessment, the types of questions that people are asked? Because I think that's where it really clicks. It's like, oh, yeah, when we talk to patients one on one, or even in our own heads, it's like, oh, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. But I really do have a preference on this, this and this. So share some of the examples of the behavioral assessment questions. Sure. So a fair number of the questions on the behavioral assessment have to do with frequency of food preferences. So what are the foods that you like? What are the foods that you eat now? And that's really going through our list of zero point foods and trying to get a sense of what people's preferences are. In the sort of crash diet culture, people would say, well, I don't care if I like it or not. I just have to do it. Um, that doesn't work. That lasts for, you know, maybe a couple minutes, maybe a couple hours, maybe a couple days. So we want to find a plan that certainly is going to require some shift in your patterns, but not a dramatic one. So that's a bulk of what we ask. We also asked about a general approach to eating and your preferences for tracking. Some people like to be guided by a list. Some people are not so much want to be guided by a list. And in exchange for that, the less that you're going to eat most of your foods from a, a list, whether that's a food list or a 200 food list or a 300 food list, that's going to be counterbalanced by how many daily smart points you get. So you can imagine that the number of smart points that's very high, let's say 300, will have the fewest number of uh, the number of zero point foods that are very high would have the lowest number of smart points. So without getting into the burden of all the numbers um, at this point, and this is all done on per a personalized basis, your height, weight, age, and sex, that basically the program leverages these two scientific foundations and then can ramp those up and down to meet a consumer's need. And let's talk briefly about zero points for those who are listening who may not be familiar with it. We talked about it a little bit in the last episode. So if we could just explain what that is and then the concept behind it. Sure. Zero point foods are foods that have been identified by the U.S. Dietary Guidelines and the World Health Organization Nutritional Guidelines as foods that are under-consumed in order to have a healthy pattern of eating. So think fruits, veg, lentils, uh, lean proteins, a variety of different foods. And they are the cornerstone of a healthy pattern of eating. We firmly believe at WW that every food is on the menu. There are no forbidden foods. You won't ever hear us say, only eat this, never eat that. That's diet talk. And we're not about that. So if that's the fundamental base, these zero point foods and these foods are chosen because of their nutritional profile and that the cornerstone of a healthy eating pattern, but also that they have low risk of overeating. This is, again, very personalized in terms of which foods uh, may be triggers for you. The other part of our program is smart points. And that's instead of counting calories, because calories may be important for weight loss and we're not reinventing the laws of thermodynamics, but 300 calories of candy is indeed different than 300 calories of broccoli. Um, so we have a point system that takes into account calories, but also includes fat, saturated fat, because not all fat's the same. Protein, because of its satiating effects, because not all carbs are the same. And we wrap behind the scenes in our app, a sign of points value to food. So again, what our members experience is a system that gives you a daily points target, and these foods are pointed. Now, you have other foods that are zero-point foods, um, and those are the foods that are the foundation of a healthy eating pattern, low risk for overeating, and it also decreases the burden of self-monitoring so those foods don't have to be weighed, measured, or tracked. So that's really our fundamental premise. And then in addition to those customizations around the plan, we also ask people questions about what time of day is most challenging for you. Is it breakfast, lunch, dinner, or late night that you need some meal suggestions? Are you more likely to eat in response to boredom, stress, being upset, or some other reason? And that's where we're really uh, in the beginning stages of this, but very excited that not only are we going to customize the plan, 
but we can now customize the experience, which is really important. It's again, as we discussed earlier, it's not just the food, it's what's in your mind and how life gets in the way and what the context is. We're trying to inspire healthy habits for real life. So we take real life, that part of our purpose very seriously, not just in the personalization and not just in the food, but in sort of the surround contextual experience. Mm -hmm, Right. And staying on track is key. And like you said, life gets in the way. And and so exactly that really helps get at some of those potential barriers and points where people might stumble and need that that extra support in a very individualized way. So I just wanted to kind of recap so that the smart points really tries to, you know, you're, we're not saying good foods, bad foods. But the points nope. try to simplify tracking and calorie counting and sort of emphasizing nutrient rich foods. And I feel like the zero points, you know, again, no good foods, bad foods, but there are foods to encourage. And there are foods that, you know, really pack a lot of maybe protein, fiber, or calcium without some of the other nutrients that we do encourage limiting or, you know, keeping an eye on. And again, making the counting easier and the tracking easier. Because again, even if we go in gung ho and okay, this is easy to count or I'm good at tracking and I do this periodically, I'll I'll be tracking and then I'll just hit a wall like, okay, I'm done tracking and you get to this fatigue point. And so that's where it's really exciting to see some of this behavioral aspect come in. Like, Yeah, exactly. And that's what I was mentioning earlier is that, you know, behavioral science has to be the foundation of everything we do. So a few years ago, when we added more zero point foods, it was just this issue that you're discussing about tracking. If we say to our members or your uh, listeners would say to their patients, track everything you eat and drink. And parenthetically, you're saying for life. It's just not sustainable. No. So what we did is listen to people and say, look, I understand tracking is important. I know when I track, I do better, but I don't want to do this for life. So again, we did this with lots of doubts, perhaps like, well, if people aren't tracking, are they still going to lose weight? They do. Because we focused on foods, does it really make a difference if it's six ounces of salmon or eight ounces of salmon? Right. Pay attention to whether it's a third of a cup of ice cream or a half a cup. Those are the things that are worth measuring and weighing. And with that perceived flexibility, because I have to count less, and also these are go-to foods now. So when I eat out at restaurants, speaking to the real life issue, I'm going to look for a food that leads that most of the plate is going to be the zero point food. So we really excited about that back when we introduced this in 2016. And then this new program, IWW, is a continued iteration of that where we can take the number of zero point foods up or down, take your daily points target. And it doesn't take a gaming theorist to figure out if we give people a points budget per day, let's say 25 is the number and you have foods that are zero point foods, we're really gamifying a system so that it will encourage the consumption of these foods that you say are nutrient rich, have high satiety value, and are low risk of overeating. Right. So that's why I wanted to kind of really solidify that the smart points and the zero points, because the three different options that you have, not only are people being asked questions to help match them with the right program, but again, like you said, The proof is in the pudding when they try it out because let's face it, sometimes you don't know till you try something and decide, oh, yeah, let me try something else and see what fits. But the odds are with this matching process that this is a good place for you to start and see how this works for you. And so what you're doing is you're adjusting the smart points and the zero points in three different ways so that people who want to track maybe a little bit less, have more zero points and fewer smart points. And and I'm probably oversimplifying it. But then people who, hey, you know what, I'm willing to track a little bit more, or it involves the flexibility aspect. And and you can kind of correct me if I kind of (laughs) am using the wrong terms. But I wanted to kind of paint a picture for our listeners about those adjustments in the, the points. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And again, we're a science-based company, so we're not going to say, you know, you can have unlimited zero-point foods and unlimited smart points. We want to balance those two, as you suggest. And that's really, again, because for some, a lot of zero-point foods will be very flexible and freeing. For others, it'll be just too much or too little. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've got to sort of keep embedded in the science, but meet people where they are. It's a big tenant of our company. 
is to meet our members where they are rather than to saying you meet us where we are you know we're the scientists we know better Mm -hmm. we're now leveraging science still but we're doing it in a way where we're reaching out to different types of people to get plans that work yeah and when you're saying for some people it's too much or too little it addresses the point of there's a lot of noise out there. And I think this is what we do as healthcare professionals and myself as a dietitian. We're trying to get people to focus on what matters most and, you know, not worry about certain things. And any dietitians listening who have counseled patients, they know typically a patient will come in and they'll say, well, I'm worried about this or this or that. And it's a good place to start. But when they learn, oh, okay, I don't have to worry about that. But here's maybe where I could focus more and get more return on my investment, so to speak. I mean, we're always trying to do that. There's so many hours in the day and so many things, uh, you know, vying for our attention that we've got to get kind of the noise and the clutter out of the way. And for some people, too many options, like you said, you go down the aisle in the grocery store, too many options is overwhelming, but people still want choices and people are different and they have different needs. So tell me a little bit more about the behavioral assessment, because I know you even ask people like how important is activity and when they're most likely to get off track. And I think these are really key things that would come out of working with somebody one on one. But now we can kind of try to help more people understand their behaviors and their tendencies. That's exactly right. And it goes back to these points of meeting people where they are and trying to inspire healthy habits in real life. And real life is going to be different for one than another. So to your point, we do ask physical activity questions. And it's a lot on how you think about physical activity, back to the mindset point, but also about the timing of it. So we ask questions about, you know, how do you think about physical activity? And one is, I'm really doing well and I want to stay here. I'm really doing well. I want to take it up or you know, I'm not that active, but to tell you the truth, like I'm just getting my feet under me and I just want to figure out what I'm going to eat for the first few weeks. And I know physical activity is important and I'll get to it, but please don't be giving me suggestions for physical activity right now. And that kind of information, uh, although it's a very simple question, can help us customize the experience. And again, one, our new my WW plan customizes the plan and the eating approach But if we just do that and we don't customize around the experience, that's not going to be as useful. Another example is if we ask people, are they likely to eat more than they planned when they're stressed and they say yes, then we can give them very direct behavioral science-based skills on stress management or what else to do when you're stressed. But we don't want to be sending that information if somebody's not a stress eater. Maybe your thing is that you eat when you're bored. So we'll send you information on that. So yeah, I'm really excited because these are things, to your point, when you're seeing patients one-on-one, these are the kind of things you get into. It's sort of the, the grist of a good uh, session with a patient. Now, from our vantage point, we're able to say, let's take those clinical pearls. Let's take those things that we all know from doing one-on-one treatment, and how can we scale them in a digital way? Um, So we're really excited about it. And the initial response to the program has just been fantastic. Wonderful. Well, let's talk about that because you've got a a six-month clinical trial going on. So what can you tell us about some of the initial results? Quite impressive. We have an approximate 8% weight loss. And that's, again, people are customized to the plan. So we have Some people, we have different plans, uh, green, blue, purple plans. They're identified by color, obviously. And what we're seeing is no difference in weight loss among those three groups. So the fact that people are customized to a plan, getting clinically significant weight loss, and no difference among those plans says that our program innovation team did good work to actually realize this promise of personalization. As you might suspect, with that kind of reduction in weight, we get a nice reduction in waist circumference. We're getting uh, about a three millimeter of mercury decrease in systolic blood pressure. And these are among people who are largely normotensive. So the baseline blood pressure is about 122, um, goes down to about 119. We're also getting whopping reductions in hunger. I think even in my days as an academic scientist before coming to WW, I was always struck by people said, when I'm trying to lose weight, I get hungry. If you look at the data in most weight management programs, at least in academic medical centers, you know, hunger goes down. And I've been 
doing this for a lot of years. And usually you see like an eight to 10% decrease in hunger measured by a visual analog scale. And that's frankly what we've seen in our previous WW programs. In this one, we're seeing an over 20% reduction in hunger, both at three months and at six months. To me, that's a really important piece of data because it speaks to livability. If we get an 8% weight loss, but you're chronically hungry, good luck. That's not going to last. So, mm. And we also, another thing that speaks to livability and ease um, is that cravings go down. So we've used the food craving inventory developed by Corby Martin, psychometrically validated, and we're getting overall reductions in cravings. And that goes across a lot of different food types. So, you know, fast food, fat, sweets, overall fat. So we think that the proof is in the pudding. People want to lose weight. So we've got to deliver on that promise. But for us, that's not enough. You can't deliver weight loss in a way that's very onerous to members. So we're able to not only get weight loss, but get reductions in cravings, reductions in hunger, improvements in waist circumference, improvements in blood pressure. So we're really pleased uh, with those data. That's wonderful. So you talked about some of the weight-related outcomes and also the hunger and the, the cravings, which, again, those things are controlled or improved. It's easier for people to keep going. But tell me about some of the exciting quality of life results that you saw, because you know it's not just about calories. It's not just about weight loss. And I know you know this, Dr. Foster, but we just want to remind everybody listening, it's about quality of life, too, and we know that. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's exactly what it's about. It's, it's helping people live a better version of themselves as they define it. And, you know, as much as people who have overweight and obesity want to lose weight, it's not the weight itself that matters, right? It's what that weight loss does for you. And if it gives you uh, less shortness of breath going up steps, if it gives you greater endurance, if you're able to tie your shoes more easily, you're able to roll around the floor with your kids and your grandkids. That's what this is about. And we hear those anecdotes on a daily basis. But when we do this more formally and scientifically, we use two measures. One's called the impact of weight on quality of life. And the other is the SF36, which is a more medical related quality of life. And we get significant improvements, double digits improvements in all of those scores. And they have the overall scores are one thing. But there are specific domains, whether it's physical functioning, work functioning, sex life, social. So all of those things across the board are increasing. And then in addition in our studies, because we want to measure things to your point that aren't just measured on the scale, but measured off the scale. We also have measures of stamina using a six minute walk test. We also have measures of flexibility using the YMCA sit and reach test. So we're really trying to bring scientifically valid methods and measure more than weight. We've been doing this for the last five or six years at WW. So it's not just weight loss, blood pressure, waist circumference. Yeah, those things are important. They're gonna drive reductions in comorbidities and they're gonna decrease the risk of various serious conditions like diabetes, hypertension, obstructive sleep apnea. But to your point, the quality of life and do you feel better and you know it's a resounding yes that so we're not just getting weight loss we're getting things measured off the scale yes and to have those actually measured in your research that's excellent one of the most exciting things that you saw an increase in cravings for fruits and vegetables and i think it's really important to highlight the results that you're seeing healthier eating patterns across all three plans. So could you talk about that? Because yes, as a dietitian, you know, I want people to, you know, have a healthy weight and have a healthy relationship with food and feel empowered and um, have that self efficacy, but I also want them to get good nutrition. <laughs> so tell me about this exciting result. That's exactly right. So as we see over the course of the study increases in fruits and vegetable cravings, that's great. But if you just get people to increase their fruit and vegetable consumption, an addition play, not a substitution play, then it's going to have negative impact on calorie balance. So it's a nice combination for our members that as the preferences for fruits and vegetables go up, that the preferences for the more calorically dense and nutritionally sparse foods, fast food fats, you know, basically sophist foods, the, the solid fats and added sugar foods actually go down. And I think the reason for that is because all three plans, and remember these 
what's really remarkable to me, we've had results similar to these to some degree in previous program, but it's been one program. The fact that the assessment can match people to this program and we're getting equivalent results across the three plans says that there are a lot of different ways to get these hmm. outcomes. And I think partly around the your food preference question and the wanting to make sure that it's nutritionally appropriate is that if we have these base of either 100, 200, or 300 zero point foods, the ones that are consistent across all three plans are fruits and veg. So we're really encouraging people to eat fruits and veg because they're going to be zero points no matter what plan you are on. So I think that's partly the reason we're seeing these changes in preferences and consumption. Yeah. I mean, who wouldn't want a decrease in hunger, an increase in cravings for fruits and vegetables, and a decrease in cravings for sweets and fast food? Who wouldn't want that? It's just very exciting. As we're wrapping up, you know, like I said, in our last discussion, our last episode, we talked about weight stigma and self-compassion. And it sounds like this new My WW program is really showing some exciting results and great potential to, again, individualize and customize opportunity for people to succeed. But let's speak to the stigma and self-compassion and uh, the work that WW is doing with different groups in this arena, because I think it's really important. Yeah, we, we think as the world's leading brand in weight management and wellness that we have a responsibility to not only improve the lives of our members through the research that we do, but also to use that research to help the broader scientific community uh, and also directly impact our members' lives. So, for example, we are currently funding the world's largest study on weight-based discrimination and stigma. And it's a study led by Dr. Rebecca Poole at the University of Connecticut, who's the world's foremost authority on this topic. And we're really trying to answer some very basic questions about when did you experience weight-based stigma? To what extent was that distressing? Who are the worst offenders? Um, And it turns out everybody is. It's close family members, it's physicians, it's people who are walking down the street. So it's a thing that our members face on a daily basis. And we think we have the responsibility to document this and to learn about what are more effective, what are the coping strategies that people are using? Are you, do you get your backup and do you get offended as you would with most cases of uh, stigma or discrimination if it was based on your sex or your ethnicity? Or do you internalize it? And many people do. And then they have coping strategies which say, yeah, I am this nonsense that society has told me. So that makes me turn to food, makes me turn to isolation, and obviously isn't good for health behavior. So we've had a, a two or three papers come out already. Um, you'll see more and more papers in the literature in this coming year on that type of work. And then we use that work to actually bring it into our workshops and to talk about it. And it's a touchy topic, right, because it's a very sensitive topic and one that brings a lot of painful recollections about how our members were treated as kids or how they're even treated now differently and poorly because of their weight. So we teach them coping strategies about a way how you keep grounded in who you are and to reinforce very loudly, very consistently, your weight is not your worth. Your worth's not measured on the scale. Um, And that leads to the last point, which we're really being very um, active in in our messaging to our members. And that's how important self-compassion is. There is this false mythology in the weight management field that the harder you are on yourself, that the more self-criticism, that the more loathful you are with yourself, the more tough love you have with yourself, the better you'll do. The science is very clear on this issue. It is demotivating when you beat yourself up, say I'm a failure, I'm weak-willed, I'm lazy, I'm undisciplined. It just does nothing except to attack your character. So we talk a lot to our members about liking your body for what it does before you lose weight, liking yourself for who you are. You have fundamental worth as a human being. And because you like yourself, like anything else, you want to improve and get outcomes to be the best version. So whether you happen to have obesity, whether you happen to have diabetes, whether you happen to have whatever condition you have, It's because you value yourself that you want to improve that condition. And that's in stark contrast to the mythology in the world of 
I can't like myself until I lose weight. If that's where you start, that's a position of weakness and you'll never lose enough weight to like yourself. So instead we encourage people because you're so valuable, because you're so worth taking care of, that's a position of strength and that will generate uh, energy and power for the process of weight and wellness improvement over the course of your lifetime. Wonderful words. Um, having a healthy relationship with ourselves, our bodies, our minds, our souls. It's, it's all very key to a quality of life, a, a good quality of life. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show again and sharing the news about the new MyWW program and the weight stigma research that you're doing and all of the updates. I look forward to staying connected with you and staying tuned to any new updates that you have. And people can, of course, connect with you and WW on social media. So I'll have all those links in the show notes at soundbitesrd.com. There's the WW website and you're on Facebook and Twitter and, and LinkedIn. So thanks again, Dr. Gary. It was so wonderful talking with you. My pleasure. It's fun to chat with you, Melissa. All right. Take care and congratulations again on your award. And for everybody listening, as always, enjoy your food with health in mind and a little customization. Till next time. Hello again. As promised, here are a few announcements from my partner, the American Association of Diabetes Educators. First, you can take a stand in diabetes care and get involved in state and national advocacy efforts with AADE's upgraded Legislative Action Center. You can discover what bills impact your area, take action on key issues, and find contact information for your elected officials. For more information on AADE's advocacy efforts, visit diabeteseducator.org slash advocacy. And if you've done some research or you know someone who has, you can share this research with thousands of other diabetes care and education specialists, because there's still time to submit an abstract for a research session or education and research poster at the 2020 AADE Annual Conference in Atlanta, Georgia in August. You can learn more at aademeeting.org. Thanks again for listening and enjoy the holidays. For more information, visit soundbitesrd.com. Music by Dave Burke.